Pilot full of color We'll leave the truth uncovered Cause only lies are white We use the words we write To shine a light on life My light is lava like It's hot and burning bright Now read, recall, recall, recite We covered every Hi everybody, we are back with another episode of And Scene I am Cynthia Dorsey I am Veronique McRae we're so happy you are here with us in the room today. We are going to go right on in today. We're excited to cover the work of Winsome Pinnock. Winsome is a British playwright, our first British playwright. Of, yes. yes, that makes me so happy, right? <laughs> um, and she's of Jamaican heritage. Um, she has been deemed, quote, probably Britain's most well-known Black female playwright. The Guardian describes her as, quote, the godmother of Black British playwrights. So, you know, right there, she is a phenomenal playwright. Mm -hmm. Uh, Winsome was born in Islington, North London. Her parents were both Jamaican migrants. I thought it was important to say that her mother was a cleaner and her father was a checker at a meat market in Smithfield. I thought that was important Mm. because a lot of times we hear the playwrights have been of affluence. We also hear like some of the playwrights' parents were artists. No, this wasn't the case. Her parents were everyday working class people. Um, She attended Elizabeth Garrett Anderson Comprehensive Girls School. When she graduated there, she went on to Goldsmiths University of London, and she graduated with a BA in English and Drama. She went on from there to Birkbeck University of London and graduated with a master's in modern literature in English. Pinnock has been the visiting lecturer at a lot of universities in in the UK. Royal Holloway College, University of London, and Senior Visiting Fellow at the University of Cambridge. She lectures also at Kensington University in London. Um, Her award-winning plays include The Winds of Change, Lead Taking, Picture Palace, A Hero's Welcome, and Lazarus, which is the play we are going to talk about today. Now, Lazarus is definitely, Veronique and I, we have, we discussed it off camera and we're like, (laughs) <laughs> what just happened here? Um, but it's our first mystery play, um, which it, it incites me to that we we are delving into different genres with our black female playwrights that we're covering, and so that just goes to show you we can write anything as black people. <laughs> okay, we can write anything. We are not do not just confine us to um, one box. We we are best in our gifts. So um, I'm really excited that we are covering this mystery. Um, This mystery, Lazarus, is taken from the biblical story of Lazarus. You know, Lazarus uh, has two sisters, Martha and Mary, and he dies, and miraculously, Jesus raises him up from the dead. So, Winsome took that biblical story, added her own characters, her own different um, context and interpretation, and turned it into a mystery. So you have um, Martha and Mary are clearly visible in it. Lazarus' name is Larry. Um, we have Christine, who Veronique and I both think might be the female version of Christ. And um, there are a few other characters. Um, so as we toil over this, I mean, what do you think, Veronique? Like, which, how do you feel about it? How do I feel about it? 
don't have a direct answer about how I feel about it, but <laughs> I think some of the, the interesting correlations in trying to find, because first we know it's not, it's not a, a complete just uh, adaptation of the biblical story, right? Because it is that mystery play component and we don't, you know, so there's a who done it aspect or what happened aspect at the end. In the biblical story, we know that eventually Lazarus is raised from the dead. Um, but what I do find interesting between the relationship between Christine and Larry, who, you know, we were saying maybe Christine is allegedly, like you said, the female version of Christ, is how it's like this, uh, what do you call it, like patient psychologist relationship or patient, you know, self-help uh, kind of approach um, and how she doesn't necessarily, she doesn't necessarily tell him what to do, but it's like saying it's within you, right? So she'll coach him like, you know, breathe in and breathe out and know, I'm just guiding you. I'm just leading you. And, you know, when she's doing those things, that's kind of, that's to me, that's kind of reminiscent of Christ. Christ doesn't just barge in and be like, do this now. It's a leading, like I'm guiding you. And if you follow me in what I'm doing, then I'll bring you to that point you need to be, you know? And so I feel like in a lot of her interactions with him, you see that correlation, but I also find it interesting because in the story of Lazarus, the sisters were like, you're not doing anything. We're telling you he's sick and he's going to die. and You're doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. So then we're like, is what, what to what extent is Christine doing things between giving the advice and the coaching and the new medications? Like, to what extent is she replicating Christ, or and to what extent could she be interjecting more than than maybe what we see in the biblical story? Because also some of those things from the biblical story of Lazarus is you know. Sometimes it will appear as if God is doing nothing and God has been ever present. You know, Christ is present the whole time and doing something even if you can't see it. Right. 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 Um, but then also Christ is supposed to be like, you know, follow me and make disciples of you and getting disciples and believers along the way. And Christine, her language is I'm guiding you. It's within you, you know. I'm just bringing out what's already in you. And we think about if Christ lives in me and Christ dwells in me, then I can do all things, you know, because I'm strengthening that later on in the biblical text, how Christ says you'll do greater things than me, you know? So then is she acting like a proxy for Christ by saying, no, it's in you, pull this out. You can do it. I'm going to give you a little bit, like I'm going to give you a medicine because Jesus Christ, he gave parables. You know, so are the parables the new medication? Now, are you going to accept it or not? And are you going to take it and ingest it in a way that is going to allow you to do what you need to do? Or are you going to take it but let it have an adverse effect? Because I can give you all the tools, but how you use them will determine what your outcome is. Right. You know, so I just find that interesting with, with their relationship and even how Larry he can be like oh thank you so much or I highlighted it I can't find the page I had a little highlight about you know he says language like you know you helped me or you saved me you know so when you start thinking of salvation and saving and I'm like I can't save a person because I'm not Christ but you're seeing the correlation of like oh you helped me you saved me that's what we see the relationship with many people throughout the biblical text with Jesus Christ. And then we're seeing this here with Larry, who is the equivalent of Lazarus. Right. I. The other theme that I really found interesting in this piece uh, occurred in, I believe it was about scene two. And there's a discussion with the character Anderson along with Larry. And Anderson is like a medical professional in the field. Um, someone Larry has been seeing um, before Larry started seeing Christine. And Basically, the discussion is that Larry is giving up his medication and Anderson is strongly advising against it. And for me, that triggered the thought process of how um, there's all this uh, tension uh, between uh, holistic medicine, healing and faith healing and, you know, the sciences and prescription medicine and medication, uh, because to Anderson, 
this scene was dangerous and all these people who've been seeing her have been coming off of her uh, off of their prescribed medication and you're saying you're feeling great but no 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 you need to be on your pills and Larry's like you know you know I'm not going to argue with you and you know like I hear you and I trust you but you know I know my own body and I don't need those pills anymore and it, it, it comes you know it makes me think of all of these uh, elements again, not only between that, uh, you know, aforementioned argument between science and faith healing, but also back to biblical text. Because when Christ started coming around, the people who were followers of the law, mm. they were like, who does he think he is? He's crazy. Y'all people are following him and we need to take him down. What are you doing? You know, you need to follow the principles of what is established X, Y, Z. And the people who began following Christ were like, you know what? I don't need that anymore. You know, it's like, Peter, don't be a fisher of fish, come be a fisher of men. So right. these people are finding these new, you know, personal healing and revelation and following Christ. While, you know, these other ones are like, who, 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 who does he think he is? He's blasphemous and what are you doing? That's dangerous to follow him. So just to see how she as a playwright weave that all together again i'm like yeah she has some beautiful tapestry coming together with her work yeah well this play also i do want to say um was first read on bbc on the radio so it was a radio play um which is exciting it, for a playwright um both of us we've written plays to know that the possibility can go beyond stage, right? It can it could be read on the radio for viewer listeners to hear. It could be produced on stage. It could be turned into a film. So there are so many different avenues as a playwright you can delve into. And it's nice to have this differentiation when we're discussing our playwright. I think we're left with a major cliffhanger. I think mm -hmm. we're left to interpret. I think it's important to note that this is using a biblical story that is left for interpretation. So she mm -hmm. wrote this piece and left it in our lap for interpretation. The Bible itself has been interpreted so many different ways by so many different people to justify actions, to not justify actions, to um, guide their lives. And so she in turn has written this story the same exact way we are left with it okay really left with it and that is the power of writing um i really like this playwright and i i really would love to read more of her work and i'm i'm just so happy we came across her to add her to our ever-growing list of black female playwrights who are writing um stories that we as black actors directors producers can mm -hmm. embody and bring to life so thank you Winsa. i mean we <laughs> we definitely toiled over this but this is good and so i would definitely tell you guys to read it please read it um so i'm so happy we covered her today we have um a phenomenal actress coming in who also will bring with her not only her gift for acting, but her dedication to biblical stories. So I'm so happy that she's coming in. Enjoy. Her. We are here with Kike Ayodeji. Hi, Kike. Hi. <laughs> Um, I'm so excited she is here today. I had the privilege of directing her in Susan Laurie Par Parks' In the Blood, along with Veronique, and they worked so well together, and we're so happy that you are here. We hear that you left us in the DMV area and moved to LA. <laughs> How did that happen? Okay, so what happened was I heard about this school called Identity School of Acting, and I really wanted to, you know, study more, um, just pursue my craft more and just hone my skill more. So I was like, oh, let me check it out. And they were actually based in London. Mm -hmm. um, so I auditioned in London, and then my mom got diagnosed with breast cancer. So I was like, no, let me stay with her. You know, I, I'd rather stay with family. So I stayed with her, and thank God she beat it. Um, and then they said, oh, we're opening a branch in Los Angeles. 
So I was like, oh, Los Angeles is closer to home. I'll just go there. So that is why I came out to LA to study more. Um, it's been a journey. There's been ups and downs, but yeah, the main reason was to study. So how long have you been there and were you able to start the program yet? Sure. So yeah, I've been out here. It's going on two years. It will be two years, September 14th. And yes, I was able to start the program. Um, the program is like you audition and they place you in either freshers, intermediate, advanced, or professional. And I got placed in advanced. So I was able to study in that group, in that cohort. And now they are online due to Corona. So I am considering moving back home to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what you feel is happening in the industry with people like you who are uh, Afri of African descent and you also are a Christian. And I wanted to know, what do you feel you need from the industry to maintain your beliefs and at the core who you are as a human being? Yeah. What do you need from the industry to help you do that? That is a really good question. Um, man, that is really good. I feel like from the industry, just because back home, um, you know, I was I was born and raised in PG County, and PG County is one of the most populous Black counties where Black people are prospering um, in all different types of income. And so I was booking like short films and um, commercials and stuff like that back home within our community and plays. Um, with you, who was a fantastic director. Um, but when I moved out here, my eyes opened. <laughs> like, I was just like, wow, I didn't know um, the industry was like this, you know, even in class, I just, I was, I experienced some colorism, where it's like, people are favored based on the color of their skin, you know, if you look exotic, you're, you're just rated higher for some reason. Um, so my eyes just open. From the industry, it's still a work in process, but as a Christian and as a black woman, which is like a double minority kind of thing, I think they need to make it okay for people to say no. To if, if that's not the role you want, it's okay to say no, you know? Um, give people more opportunity, give people, I have a friend who started something called um, Cast Black Talent on Instagram, where it's where it's showing, it's giving actors the room and their voice. And people have been coming out with their testimonials about things they've experienced um, out here in Hollywood from the industry. So I think for me, what I need is just an okay, like more space to be able to put my work out there. I think it honestly starts from the individual um, where it's like, like you guys are both creators, you know, you guys have created projects, plays. I think that's where it starts from because no one's going to make room for me if I don't make it for myself. Yeah. So you kind of just answered the next question that came uh, <laughs> to my mind well, um, in that um, with seeing the blocks that are there at this juncture um, with you being able to have school, somebody that's having this pause with the pandemic what do you think some of your possible next steps will be? Do you feel yourself being led to be like, you don't have to let me in the room, I'm going to build my own building? Or where are you feeling led to now that you've kind of had this experience seeing how they operate? Yeah, um, definitely. I think moving out here caused me to want to become a multi-hyphenate, where it's like, I want to write my own work. I want to direct my own work. I want to even produce my own work. Whereas um, before I was just like, oh, I just want to audition and be in someone's project. Um, being out here opened my eyes to that process. Even Issa Rae, like we saw how she started. She started on YouTube and now she has, you know, Insecure and she has a whole bunch of films. Um, so it just, gave me that passion to want to do my start from the bottom and then get to the top. So writing my own work and you guys are awesome examples of that, you know? Um, yeah, it just made me bolder 
Um, and it, ma it made me want to have my own voice. So for example, like you guys said, I'm Christian. Um, I'm also first generation Nigerian, you know? So that's also a story that I want to tell. And I have to tell that story. What do you think um, the film industry is like in Nigeria? Are you, do you think that it is translated in America fairly? Mm, that's a good question. Um, the other day, I was just thinking about how when I was younger, my mom used to go to the Echo food store, and she would have to get DVDs of Nollywood film to watch it. But now we're seeing all the films on Netflix, which is awesome. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen some Nollywood films on Netflix. Um, they're even on like Amazon Prime. They're everywhere. So exposure is booming, and I'm proud of Nollywood for that. Um, I think the other day I had a conversation with a casting director out here and she was just saying, um, although she loves all the opportunity that Hollywood is giving Nollywood, she wants Nollywood to be careful and take their own ownership, if that makes sense. Like start your own Netflix, you know, um, what they want. She was just saying what they want is the money, you know, they don't <laughs> necessarily care about investing truly investing but she was just like start like nigeria nollywood can start their own stuff so i think there's two sides to the narrative but i am proud of nollywood nollywood stand up okay <laughs> i think it's amazing because my sister um right now i'm actually floating in north Carolina. well technically i'm in the dmv today but i'm in north carolina for a while and um my sister and i started watching all of them films that came out on Nollywood with Netflix because yeah. for me, um, for me just to be able to see talent and, and it not be stereotyped because for me, the things that I got exposed to younger and I knew it was a false narrative because I had the opportunity to travel across seas as a teenager, but just being able to see those bodies of work and how powerful they are and then hear stories that are like directly coming from the mouths of people who live those stories exactly. to me is always like inspiring. So to hear you saying that you want to like begin to do that as well, because I'm like, nobody can tell your story better than you. Right. Um, but it invites us to get to learn more and dismantle stereotypes. Is there anything floating in your mind right now that you think you would either want to write for others to perform in, or if you could write your own, perfect role, what would that role be right now? Oh, um, I would love to write for others. I think that would be a beautiful thing, just to write stories. I did start writing my own. Um, I'm still deciding if it's going to be a web series or a short film, but I did start that. Um, and in, in the short film, I'll say short film for now. She is um, a Nigerian American who wants to be, I'm deciding if she wants to be an actress or an artist and um, her mom wants her to be a doctor, you know? And so we just navigate through her life and all her challenges and all her joys and ups and downs. It's still in the beginning process, but I think that would be the perfect role for me. Um, also, I, I was able to kind of act in, a, in something like that. It's called Plantain and Proverbs. It's on Amazon Prime, um, where I was able to portray a woman named Ada, who is a Nigerian American woman. So I think those are my perfect roles, just because I love um, telling stories about how I grew up, um, how my parents were strict, and just trying to be, trying to fit in, you know, in America, but still having to obey your parents, you know? So mm -hmm. yeah. I've seen your work on the stage. I've seen your work on YouTube, Amazon, all of these places we can see your face. Can you tell us what your best experience has been so far? And the second part to the question is, do you prefer theater over film? Okay. Or which one do you prefer? Ooh, ooh, my best experience. <laughs> um, a film that I always remember is Rivermint. Um, we shot that 
in what did we shoot that in DC and Virginia, and that was with director Shayla um, Rakio. And the reason why that comes up to me for film is um, it was just very challenging. I had to um, audition for it. I had to do a callback. Um, and it was when I was first starting out, so I was really afraid to go. Um, I was like, no, I'm not going to go. I told, I used to go to McKinney Acting Studios. I don't know if you're familiar with that studio in Maryland. And so I told my coach, I was like, I don't want to go. And he was like, you should go. Like, if you don't go, don't come to class. <laughs> so um, <laughs> from the beginning to the end, and then just being able to, because it's a civil rights film, um, that's another role I'm passionate about, telling stories of, you know, I'm learning so much about what Black people had to go through through, you know, in America, you know, um, I think it's just beautiful to help me telling those stories so that our children will know. I know that some schools are trying to hide history now, which is very stupid, but I love being in films, period pieces. So it was a period um, piece. And there was, there was one scene where um, someone is getting beat by police and white people are cheering him on. And I remember when we were filming, people would stop. And like, there was a lot of traffic, but people would still stop. And they were honking their horns and they were like, yes, yes. Like, this is a real story. Like we support this. And I was just like, wow, this is amazing. You know, I will never forget this moment. And then theater wise, I would say working with you guys because Woo, I, I grew, <laughs> I grew, okay? Um, I remember it was in the blood, Susan Lori Parks, and I, those monologues were long, um, very long. I think Veronique had like the longest. <laughs> <laughs> Never <laughs> ending monologues. <laughs> but they were so long and um, I felt like I couldn't do it, but we did it, you know, and Cynthia, you whipped us into shape, okay? Yes, um, <laughs> <laughs> with us into shape, and I love it because um, I think in rehearsals, you would make us redo it. Like, you'd be like, start from the beginning, start from the beginning, start from the beginning, and I'm just like, why is she making us start from the beginning, you know? <laughs> I, I see why, you know, after being in class and stuff, I see why. Um, so those two are memorable moments for me. I prefer film. <laughs> um, I prefer film just because I, I love film. Like even when I'm not in front of the camera, I'll go to a lot of screenings. I'll just, I love going to the movie theater just to like decompress my mind and like watch shots and like just try to guess what camera they use for that shot or like what lighting technique they use um so i prefer film over theater i still love theater like i believe theater is look one one take you on stage you, you gotta kill it you know film you can do various takes but i just love film yeah <laughs> so for one of the other questions I had, because I think it's something, and I kind of had some of those breakthrough moments um, in doing, being directed by Cynthia, and especially also when we did In the Blood. Um, yeah. But when, so when I, I was doing In the Blood, I was just coming out of divinity school and in another divinity program. Wow. And how do you reconcile with text or characters that may or may not align with personal belief systems? Like, do you have an approach mm -hmm. um, when you encounter a character and how you approach and portray that character and then how you maybe decompress or separate or whatever the term may be when you're back off stage or off set? Ooh, that is so interesting. I think I remember coming up to you actually um, when we were doing the show and I was like, how, like, how are you, like, how are you doing this? Because <laughs> Susan Lori Park, she, um, she has no filter, you know, she says whatever she wants to say. And I think I was like, oh my gosh, um, she's saying this, like my character saying this. And I think you gave me um, a like really good advice that I still take to this day. Um, don't judge your character. 
don't judge your character. Um, your character is a person. Your character is not you, you know? Um, so you are telling their story. You are the body and the vehicle in which you are telling their story. Like you just said in the question, once you're done on stage, you leave the character on stage and you move on, you know? Um, I think that's what I took from that. And I think doing it made me, and seeing the audience's reaction made me see like, oh yeah, this is someone's story. You know, I have no right to judge this person. This is someone's life. Like someone, I think I played welfare, bully and welfare. Someone is on welfare. Someone was on welfare. You know what I mean? This is someone's experience. Who am I to judge them? This is life. Um, and I think living by myself, living in LA has matured me. Um, I was home, when I was in the play, I was home with my mama. I still, I have responsibilities, but whew, I got responsibilities now. So <laughs> <laughs> being in the real world, world and just living more has opened my eyes to see like, man, people have stories. Like, and if you are given the blessing and honor of telling that person's story, then do it and put your whole foot in it. And then just remember like, leave that person at the stage, leave that person on the scene, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I remember, I remember you struggling with, uh, welfare a lot. Yeah. A lot with your, your personal convictions and the way in which, I think I'm the one who told you to go talk to Veronique because, uh, <laughs> you know, go talk to her, I'm, and you know, my, myself too, I, the three of us, we all, we, the three of us, we're Christian. And so a lot of times we have to wrestle with what we've been taught, what our beliefs yeah. are, mm -hmm. and still be a creative. And it's not an easy task, but you committed to the character and you, yes, you, you were great. You were wonderful. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you go into to audition and read for co-reading, what <laughs> do you do to get through that experience? Ooh, um, definitely try to read it. If you have time to read it, read it over once and then um, try at least to get down the first line and then the last line. And then just go, I think for now, right now where I am, I would say, um, don't be afraid to go with instinct. Like if you, you might be wrong, you, you are going to be wrong, but if you're going to be wrong, be wrong a hundred percent, you know, like go big. Um, I think that's what I'm learning now. Just go big. Don't be afraid. You know, they know it's a code read. Um, they know that you haven't had time to fully go over it and memorize it. So yeah, that's what I would say. Okay, well, today Kike will be reading from the play Lazarus, Lazarus by Winock Pentum. And we, we, Veronique and I cover female artists of color who, playwrights of color, we cover mm -hmm. their work. And I'm excited for you to read from Miss Pinnock's work today. Um, Kike will be reading the character of Christine and Veronique will read Larry. Are you ladies ready? Yes. Okay. Breathe in and out again. Feel the healing light of the breath bathing every cell in your body, disinfecting the disease cells. Feel the energy surging through you and relax. Take one last look around your secret sanctuary. Whenever you feel a crisis coming on, this is the place that you can retreat to for healing and sustenance. Now close the door behind you and step out into the beautiful garden. Feel the sunshine on your back as you walk across the lawn. And at the count of six, open your eyes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Wide awake. 
wide awake. I could have lain there forever. How do you feel? Like a new man. You're a miracle worker. Hardly. It's your body. I'm just a guide. And what we talked about last time, have you given that any more thought? I've thought about nothing else all week. And? It's a big step. You know me as well as I do that drugs only manage the body symptoms. They can't cure you. In fact, they cause even more problems themselves. And the medical profession has the cheek to call these crises side effects. The thought of not taking anything scares me half to death. If you need a pill, I can give you one. Open your hand and... Open your hand. I can't look at them all knotted and, and gnarled. Let me help you. Mm. There, take that. Do you need a glass of water? But there's nothing there. There are vast areas of the brain whose function is still a mystery to the scientist. I too believe in science until I learned how to tap into the power of those uncharted regions. And look what happened to me. I was completely healed. If it worked on me, it can work on you. Do you trust me? Yes, of course I do. Do you trust yourself? I, I don't know. You may not believe in yourself, but I believe in you. I was cured and the same thing can happen to you. Look at your hand, Larry. Can you see it? A pill that glows like a tiny star. Yes, <laughs> I can see it now. That little pill has a hundred times more healing power than all the medication that your doctor is encouraging you to contaminate yourself with. And I can be healed just like you were? Yes, Larry, yes. Do you believe me? I, I'm not sure. The power is within you. You don't need the doctors and their lies. You can heal yourself. Say it, Larry. Yes. I don't need the doctors and their lies. I can heal myself. The power is within me. Yes. And scene. <laughs> that was fun. Really my screen froze. <laughs> oh no, it's okay. It's like it's not there. Where did it go? <laughs> Because they played that really well, though. <laughs> you I know. I was like, let me say the line again. I was like, like, yes, TK for the cover. Taking a beat. I didn't know it, bro. Can I ask you guys a question? Yeah. Well, I guess, wait, I'll let you ask your question, and then I'll ask my okay. question. How do you feel about the cold read? I like it. Um, I really like it. I don't... I want to, I guess I want to read this play now because I'm like, is this person sick? Like, why is he telling them to take the pill with the little, um, the gold star or a little small star? But I like it. I'll, I'll definitely send you the whole play. Okay. okay. What did you want to ask? 
I just want to ask you guys a little something, something too, because I, <laughs> I just feel like I haven't um, spoken with you guys in so long, and I'm just happy to be on this call. Um, so for both of you, what are you guys doing during this um, quarantine to create? And like, how are you dealing with like, I guess, the mental effects, you know, like some people I know are so lonely because um, they're by themselves. Some people are just like, oh, my gosh, I had so much planned and everything is gone. So what are you guys both doing? Well, um, you want to go first? Or, <laughs> oh, you want to go first? Um, well, I did for the, the first for the first few weeks. I was like, oh, my God, what happened? Everything's down. Um, so I won't, I will say, I think I went through a little bit of this, uh, a downward for a bit because I was just like, I was just starting to get things in motion, yeah. you know? And, um, and then like in talking to Cynthia and other people, I was like, you know, like take this time. I think I had to be like, okay, sometimes God, you know, see what God wants you to do in this time. Like maybe you need to rest. And then after you rest, maybe you need to, you know, recalibrate um, and things like that. So um, I've been, focusing a little bit more on actually the catering that I do because that's like my my everyday like the food part that's yeah. like my get my money kind yeah. of work um and I do have a cooking show um that just started on Roku not too long ago so I'm still able that's to awesome. take that even COVID you know we just do it COVID style like hey we're in my kitchen so yeah. you know excuse that um <laughs> and um I am um, was supposed to be, the goal was to start sh shooting my first SAG feature film, but I'm glad it paused because it's given me time to do more research and like more fundraising and different things that wouldn't have quite been the case if I had started filming. Yeah. Um, and I think just like working on me. So it's like I was, you know, scheduled to do headshots and different things and kind of get back out there and I was blessed to get um, to be cast in a project that films in New York. Um, and I was supposed to be back in New York to film when everything stopped. So it's just been like, okay, well just pause, just breathe, get your personal together. You know, um, what kind of shots do you want to get when you get back? And do you have this organized in your house? And the book that you started writing like years ago, finish it because you're sitting in the house and, um, I think also just personally, reflectively kind of tapping back in. I mean, like, okay, God, what parts needed some, you know, a little bit of restoration, some love on yourself. Yeah. And, um, but I think what quarantine has done for me most is made me really focus on what is it that I truly feel led to do. Um, because, um, you know, there are people who won't have that chance again. So God has been you know, has kept me so far and covering me. So what is it that I believe God is really putting me to do and yeah. trying to zone in on that, that more and let the rest of the stuff fall away because the rest of the stuff, it might not even be bad stuff, but if it's not what you really called or yearning to do, it's not good for you and your, you know, your journey. So yeah. for me, it's been kind of like shedding, picking up what needs to be picked up and letting go of what needs to be let go of, I think, for quarantine. That's good. Uh, me when I so I you know I teach and I I love my students but I was just in a place before quarantine where the adults in the building were causing me so much angst and anxiety like I did it I wasn't happy so the day in which they closed school I ran out of the building like I remember I dropped my goddaughter off with her mom I went to Marshall's I got new wine glasses and I got a bottle of wine and I went home and I drank that whole bottle <laughs> wine. and I think I laid around for a couple of days not that long I just laid around um, of course, we still had work to do. We had to record lessons for our students, do live lessons, and I was still working. And I was just like, you know what, Cynthia, you have the time right now to do whatever it is you want to do. Yeah. Now, granted, mm -hmm. I had all of these plans for 2020. Oddly enough, only a few were creative um, things, okay? So I my, my 
two of my best friends were getting married. I was going all the way to Texas to celebrate and going to Cabo. And then I was in uh, South Africa. And then I was like all of this traveling stuff I was really excited about. But I hadn't quite mapped out what my creative ventures would be in 2020. And I think this was the time to do it. You know, all of the trips got canceled. My friend's wedding got canceled. Um, I had nothing but time. And so that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing. I've, I've, ha- I've mapped out what I want to do for the remainder of the year, virtually, um, and projects that I've been putting on the back burner. They like, I've, I've done budgets, I have everything. So, um, and scene was an idea that I had a long time ago that I just went with. Uh, it's a few podcasts that I'm working on. Um, I'm getting ready to work on this animated series that I, I've been, you know, dreaming about that I kept saying I was going to do, kept putting it on the back burner. I can do it now. And so I'm not one of the people that is sad to be in the house or not or social distancing i'm actually really grateful um and being like an introvert not <laughs> being out in the world <laughs> every need that i have so i'm okay i am though saddened that our country is now not being able to travel to other yeah. places because mm-hmm. our administration did not make sure we were safe and did not make sure that we had the necessary things in place to keep us well. Um, so, you know, wanting to go to Europe or travel with my friend to Bali, you know, we can't do that. Yeah. You know, right. certain Places are saying, if you are a U.S. citizen, you can't come over here. Others are saying, you got to get tested. Others are saying, you got to spend two weeks in quarantine. Well, I'm only going over there for a week. So, right. you know, but um, hopefully that will change soon. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm staying prayerful for sure and mm-hmm. hopeful that we can get this under control. But until then, I'm really going to focus on what makes me happy, uh, yeah. finding another job. And the thing is, I was hoping I would I would find another job immediately and be able to start. And it's not looking like that will happen. And I think it's because I'm challenging myself to find the job that fits my passion. Yeah. Teaching is definitely my passion. Teaching kids theater, my passion. But the education system and the way in which um, teachers are oppressed is not. And it, you know, it's not for me. Um, so maybe teaching looks different from my end of things, private lessons or something. But I really want to go full throttle into media and the arts, you know, arts administration, that sort of thing. And that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm applying for. So I'm really happy that God gifted me with this time to be able to do that. Yes. Okay. Like, I love it. I love it. I love hearing about, you know, both of you guys and, you know, the updates and stuff. It's, yeah, for some people, um, the quarantine has been really bad, but for others, it's been good, you know. Um, Rest in peace to everybody who lost their lives, of course. Um, But yeah, it's been two sides to the quarantine, so... Yeah, and I think sometimes it's interesting you have to be able to, for some people, like, you know, it's a different story if you're, like, living through and with someone or yourself who's caught COVID-19, you know, that's a whole different kind of perspective and in, 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 in trial and whatever word that I can't really yeah. think of and I'm looking for. And then, you know, I think for me, it was like, you know, if you need to, maybe you can't handle quarantine right now, if you need to rest, rest. If it's the time that you feel like you can fly with things, fly with them, you know, I think people really have to, you know, assess what they need in this time, because what I may need may not look the same as what they need. But I also think it's about perspective, because, you know, if by the grace of God, you're healthy during this, you know, then you got to change that perspective, because it could be different, you know, like could be different. And I think for me, that's what I had to snap. I was like, you know what, this was really daunting. 
in the beginning. It was really shocking. Yeah. Um, and I just needed some days not to, to think, just to rest. And once I did that, it was like, change your perspective. Exactly. Like, yeah. what can you do in this time? Don't, don't look at what can't happen or what, what may have, you know, opportunities you may not get right now. Because as long as you're living and breathing, stuff will come around. You know, things will come back into place. But I think it's really about changing that, you know, changing that perspective if you can. And then as a creative, what can I do? No, I'm not on set. Like they, because New York has been in place to do whatever, they've started calling people back to set. But wow. my main address is North Carolina. North Carolina can't go to New York. So right. even if it was time for my episode, I can't go back to set either way. Okay, right. but what can I do? to keep my craft going at home. What, you know, there's tons of free Zoom classes all of a sudden or writing or exploring other talents you've had, you know, you have that you haven't been able to do or like Cynthia has been launching all the projects, you know, that she's had that pen and paper to forever. It's like, oh, now I can do it, you know. So just taking that time, what can you do? You yeah. know, instead of looking at everything that, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that. Instead, I think it's like speaking and shifting the narrative. What can I do? And that'll have you set up so that whatever this norm, new normal looks like or however things begin to resume, you'll be rested and you'll be prepared to then run with it instead of trying to gear yourself back up again once things happen. You know, when things start opening, oh, there's her animated series and her podcast right. and her such and such and she did this. Oh, I, Kike, she wrote more on her web series. She can pitch it or she can, you know, yeah. I think it's really about Rest when you need to, but then know when to work and use the isolation as a positive, you yeah. know? Yeah, definitely being grateful. Like this, I know everyone, like once things flow into normal, we won't take for granted, like even going to a friend's birthday dinner or, you know, right. going right. shopping, like just being grateful to do things the normal way. 2020 has been a year. <laughs> yeah, still can't hug my niece. When I drive by or I go to see her, I'm like, you got to have your mask, you know. Uh, she'll, sometimes she'll cry, you know, because she's like, I want to give you a hug. So I have to do air hugs right now. But I know when I can give her a big hug again, it's going to be awesome. And I won't, you know, yeah. this contact won't be a thing that I'm so much like away from anymore because it's like, I can't do it right now. You know, so. Exactly. Sheesh. Well, we thank you so much for coming on today. Um, I appreciate you. I love you. And I know that your career is going to go to new heights just based on how meticulous you are about training, um, convicted you are to the character work. And I hope that you feel it. And I know <laughs> that the best is yet to come. So hey, man, thank you guys for having me. I saw the email and I was like, oh little on me. Because <laughs> <laughs> you guys are so both very talented, you know. So I appreciate um just being able to work with you guys in the past and now and hopefully in the future. So thank you for having me. You're welcome. Nice. Bye. 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 Stay safe. The yellow, 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 the yellow,